Eric. Eric. I don't know how we did on the actual audio because we're not synced up in real time. But uh, tell us in the comments below, how synced up were the Eric's today? Um, knowing that we could simply have Brandon edit it so that we were perfectly synced up. So if they're not, you know that we are being honest because we are the truth bringers. And today it is a uh, Iron Culture episode of just the Eric's bringing you the truth. Uh, and by truth, I mean a uh, speculative narrative conversation on something that's just becoming elucidated. But no, I'm actually really excited about this conversation. Um, the one downside to not having Omar on with us today, it's actually multiple downsides. He's a great guy. Is that we have a review that is specifically speaking to you, Dr. Trexler, that we wanted to get a live react on that we uh, almost read last time. But of course, the, uh, the three star cross lovers have not been in the same place for the last few episodes. But I'm looking forward to our next trio episode. But today we have a, a science power hour. Uh, I just got a text in real time. No, sorry, Eric, not today, but I'll be 100% available next week to do an episode. Amazing. That'll probably be while I'm traveling. It'll just be the two of you. <laughs> but maybe I, I could sneak it in while I'm away because it it'll, it'll, will be a work trip. But anyway, we'll see. By text, Helms, or I mean, uh, Omar did make an appearance in this episode just now. Yeah, actually, let's officially make it. There Bam. he is. Well, look at that. All right. Those of you on YouTube, you just got some bonus content seeing uh, on iPhone Omar Isab next to a text message. You're really li missing out if you're on Spotify or iTunes, but, um, you know. It's a video show. We just put it on the audio formats. It really is. You know, it's, it's, it's more of just kind of a bonus feature for the people who aren't consuming it in its true intended uh, medium. So, anywho, no uh, reviews to read today. That, that is something we want to save for the, the, the trio. Um, but we do have a really cool conversation, and this is something, a topic that's actually very close to both of our interests. Um, I'm going to kick this off as I, it's a very rare thing for me to do where I relate this to myself, my own experiences, and my own accolades or things I've done. So this will be a departure from my typical introduction. Um, but I wrote a article for Mass that was also one, in one of some of our best of issues, and it was released as like a promotional, like free, free to read, not behind a paywall. Can you stay shredded? Which we also did a little bit of a short video on Omar's YouTube channel about. It was on Stronger by Science. It was one of my my articles that I was really proud of because, to me, I was seeing through the lens of uh, competition bodybuilding that a lot of the experiences that competitors go through in contest prep are straddling a lot of the Venn diagrams that are heavily related, but not necessarily connected, at least in terms of how the research is pr presented and the mechanisms involved and who is conducting it and haven't been really formally combined, even though they are, to me, very apparently linked. And what I wrote about was that, hey, you know, I think contest prep bodybuilders are experiencing uh, the converging factors of things like relative energy deficiency in sport due to low energy availability. Uh, they're experiencing uh, metabolic adaptation or adaptive thermogenesis, two different separate research fields heavy, heavily related. And they're also traversing below what is sometimes called their body fat setting point or settling point, or probably best described by Speakman's dual intervention model below their lower intervention point. And the reason why one cannot stay in contest condition or the vast majority of people can't um, is because of the convergence of many of these factors and their interlinked nature and how, hey, when you're below your settling point, you're probably going to be experiencing things like metabolic adaptation, which means that you will be consuming too low of an energy availability. And therefore, you may be experiencing some of the symptoms of REDS, making at least a certain degree of leanness probably unsustainable and why we see this phasic process that bodybuilders go through and that we do see certain symptoms, people who try to stay too lean uh, and how that can be counterproductive and why. And I tried to kind of construct this model, and then I, I, I quote unquote stress tested it with some, some preliminary data we have. So I was really encouraged to hear that you just recently got back from a conference. Is that right, Eric? Correct. Where you talked about this, and that there is actually not just you know Eric Helms going, isn't this all interesting and connected? Thinking that I'm you know leading the zeitgeist, but actually there's a bunch of researchers who are already interested in this, making these connections and um, doing some interdisciplinary work, which I find is encouraging. Uh, I always love to see that. I think we need more of it. Um, and uh, you're actually giving talks on it. So 
it sounds like you've got you got a story to tell. Is that right? Yeah, and I think that's definitely the way to put it because um, this uh, episode of Iron Culture is definitely going to be more like narrative form. I basically want to go back through um, where a lot of this research emerged. Um, things really started heating up in the 70s and 80s. And by heating up, I mean starting, but at a rapid clip. Uh, people identified, uh, you know, hey, there's some work that needs to be done here. Um, and in the time since, you know, really um, distributed evenly throughout the last 40 or 50 years, there's been a lot of work uh, on this general umbrella of terms that are related to either low energy availability or excess amounts of physical activity. Um, and the, these different terms that we'll go through one by one, there's no question that they share a significant amount of, uh, amount of overlap. Like you said, there, there's clearly a Venn diagram going on here with many different parts. And this episode's going to be a bit unique because I'm not going to deliver the finished product. I'm not going to say, here's a story with a tidy ending and here's exactly how they fit together. Um, this is more the before rather than the after picture where we're going to kind of put these terms on the table, talk about what they share in common, talk about the distinctions, uh, the differences among them. Um, we're not probably going to have the complete unified theory of everything put together by the end of this episode, but it's more of a brainstorming session, a history lesson. But I will say for those listening along, there will be some practical utility. You know, I'll, I'll at least give you some heuristics that you can use at the end to try to troubleshoot what you might be experiencing or what your clients might be experiencing. So if you're saying, okay, like I've got a client and maybe it seems like their energy expenditure is lower than we think it should be, or for some reason they just feel like crap right now and we're trying to figure out why, um, or, you know, for some reason, their testosterone is low, and and we're trying to figure out what that's all about. Um, those all kind of find their way into this picture here in different areas. So uh, I don't know. What do you say that we just dive in and get started with the history lesson? No, I love it. And uh, in, in classic Tolkien fashion, before we got the Lord of the Rings, he needed to do the world building that we see in a you know anthology style. Silmarillion. And even after that, there needed to be the Hobbit to establish what it feels like to tell a narrative in this, in this place before we finally get to, you know, the fourth age and some conclusions and seeing where the future is going to go. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Tell the story. I will be an apt listener and, um, and, and, and I will chime in where I can. Cause like I said, this is a, an area that I'm very interested in as well. Well, the Hobbit, that's going to be our our goal is to turn a very short outline into a nine hour, three part trilogy of film. Okay. So, uh, we will expand upon my outline and maybe this will be the first ever nine hour episode that we do. It's hard to say. Uh, let's go Sir Peter Jackson. Yeah. He's your, your guy, right? In New Zealand, you have to be a big Peter Jackson guy. You mean Sir Peter Jackson? Oh, my, my mistake. Absolutely. Um, all right. So let's start out at the top here. So low energy availability. Um, this is something that you've written about and talked about. Uh, I've alluded to it in various articles. And I, I guess I should acknowledge on the front end, one of the reasons I want to have this, uh, this conversation here is to atone for my sins, Helms. Uh, in a lot of my previous work about metabolic adaptation, uh, I can look back with a revisionist perspective I guess not revisionist, but wishing I could revise. I think I lumped, I have a tendency to lump too many things into metabolic adaptation. Um, mm. You know, you can look at metabolic adaptation through a very narrow lens. Um, the most narrow lens I've ever seen is just saying, we are only looking at resting metabolic rate, uh, the difference between measured and predicted. Um, and then you can look at a more you know, a broader lens where you're saying, no, it's just total daily energy expenditure, you know, measured versus predicted. Um, now, in the past, I've kind of zoomed out and even further than that with a much broader lens. And I've said, well, no, let's look at the entire kind of syndrome of metabolic adaptation, the various things that a person experiences in the, the example of a, a prepping physique athlete, right? So, 
if if uh, low energy expenditure were the beginning and the end of the problem, we could deal with that pretty easily, right? But when we look at metabolic adaptation and everything that comes with it in the context of a prepping physique athlete, um, it's this wide ranging collection of effects that impact thyroid hormone and sex hormones and reproductive function and uh, and you name it, you know, throw it in there. It's this whole kind of collection uh, of, of different... Still a little muscle efficiency. Exactly, yeah. A, a whole uh, collection of, it's hard to call them anything other than symptoms, right? Um, so what I want to do is is kind of look at the building blocks of how we get there uh, by looking at different pieces of this whole umbrella of terms that fall under low energy availability. So we'll start at the top. Low energy availability is basically a term that in the research describes insufficient energy intake relative to one's exercise load. So this terminology stays firmly in the world of people who do some form of exercise. And uh, a, a specific definition in quotes, um, this is from a review paper I read by Jose Arita and colleagues, probably pronounces that Arita. Um, I've talked to the man, but I never asked him, how do you say your last name? But uh, the amount of dietary energy available to sustain physiological function after subtracting the energetic cost of exercise, right? So if you've ever read a paper about low energy availability, uh, you'll see the equation laid out there, um, kind of t taking that definition in word form and turning it into numbers. Um, and so insufficient energy availability is going to be due to either increased exercise or reduced energy intake or a combination of both. Um, but the reason that low energy availability started to get a lot of recognition and a lot of attention in the research world is because of its effect on the endocrine system. So when you have low energy availability, it is a very substantial uh, disruptor of the typical endocrine, you know, of your typical hormone levels. And there's some certain hormones that it seems to particularly particularly uh, interfere with. Um, the reason that a lot of folks got interested in studying low energy availability, um, and this stuff goes back to the 80s and 70s, really, um, and one person who's, I think, contributed more than anybody in this area is Anne Lukes. She pronounces mm -hmm. her name Lukes, right? I believe so. So um, she's done a lot of incredible work on this. And the, init the initial observation where people said, hey, we got to start looking into this, is a lot of female endurance athletes who were not regularly menstruating. You know, they either had amenorrhea, the absence of a menstrual cycle, or they had oligomenorrhea, which is um, a, a, a disruption. Disrupted. Yeah, a disruption of the uh, menstrual cycle. So it was kind of irregular, um, you know, ir irregular length, sometimes missing periods here and there. So um, basically, this dysregulation of the menstrual cycle or complete loss of it really got people interested in studying this. And as people started looking into it more, they were looking at low energy availability as the cause of this. And ultimately, that's where the field kind of settled uh, for the most part. And specifically, there were two kind of hypotheses going on simultaneously. One was perhaps um, exercise is just so stressful. You know, exercise is a stressor and the acute response to exercise um, has, you know, uh, signatures that are similar to uh, just any kind of broad generic stress response, uh, especially when you look at the kind of endocrine response. So some folks said, well, maybe exercise is just a potent stressor and female athletes are losing their menstrual cycle because of the stress of exercise. Uh, the second hypothesis was maybe there's just not enough energy to really allocate toward what we might consider non-essential but energy-intensive physiological functions, such as having a regular menstrual cycle. So I think uh, researchers, um, as this was really, as this research was really getting sussed out initially, everyone kind of gravitated toward the idea that menstrual dysregulation was being caused by a drain of energy rather than the stress of exercise. So, so people. I think the hypothesis of insufficient energy to maintain a normal menstrual cycle really won out uh, in that head-to-head -head battle. But this is where the story, we, we get our first transition to a new, a new term, right? So the female athlete triad, 
Now, if you're an old timer like me and Helms, you're very familiar with that term. If you're a young person, you may be like, what's that? Um, and that's because the term is basically already deprecated. You, you really don't see it that much anymore. But uh, folks were building off this research on low energy availability, and they said, you know what? It's true. Low energy availability seems to be causing dysregulation of the menstrual cyc cycle in exercising women. However, there's more than that. We're, we're seeing this kind of three-part syndrome of... Uh, observe symptoms that seem to be kind of feeding into each other. And those three things are number one, disordered eating, number two, amenorrhea, and then number three, low bone mineral density. And this is all being observed in exercising women. And we can kind of think of this uh, sequentially. And of course, it's cyclical, right? These things reinforce each other, but we can kind of think of the the sequence of development here in terms of clinical manifestations. So first, you've got a female endurance athlete. And again, this is the female athlete triad that we're talking about. So a female endurance athlete who, um, for a variety of reasons, may be predisposed to disordered eating, you know? Um, and so what that's going to lead to is chronically low energy availability. You know, you're putting in your endurance training mileage plus uh, caloric restriction due to disordered eating, insufficient nutritional input. That's going to lead to endocrine changes, um, particularly affecting the sex hormones involved with, and the hormones kind of higher up the cascade from the hypothalamus that ultimately control the menstrual cycle. That leads to amenorrhea. And then this prolonged, chronic, uh, you know, low energy availability, amenorrhea, all put together, the endocrine effects of low energy availability leads to low bone mineral density. And, and so unfortunately for a lot of female athletes, um, you know, not having a period in certain sports or having a disrupted or dysregulated period is so common that sometimes people will kind of look past that symptom entirely and say, ah, that's what happens when, when you run cross, cross country or when you're a marathon runner, whatever the case is. Unfortunately, a lot of women weren't really noticing that there was a problem. They weren't really having any clinical um, presentation that was, you know, setting off alarm bells until they were experiencing ramifications of low bone mineral density. So uh, if you ever talk to a clinician who's worked in sports medicine, it's not at all unusual to have female endurance athletes who are uh, very slender, you know, uh, very, yeah, at the low end of the BMI range, uh, you know, the quote unquote normal BMI range or below it, you know, very, very thin and who present with serial stress fractures uh, of the lower extremity. And um, pro probably the most um, uh, like obvious case of this I've ever heard of was a, a female endurance athlete. Um, I, I took a class with a like the, the person that taught this class was the head of athletic training at Ohio State for like a million years. And, uh, so he had every story in the book, um, and it was crazy. Like some, some of it was things I never thought you'd expect to see in a career as an athletic trainer. Uh, like, I mean, really tragic stuff. Uh, this individual, uh, she was an endurance athlete and she presented with a stress fracture of the lower extremity, nothing unusual there. So they said, okay, wear this boot, you know, and then we'll, we'll kind of see how it recovers and we'll get you back to, you know, they call it return to play in the biz. So we'll, we'll see how it's recovering. We'll get you back running as soon as we can. Well, she comes back in for her checkup and the walking boot is mangled. And they said, what, what happened here? And it turns out she was doing her normal mileage with a boot. I mean, like a legitimate endurance athlete, collegiate athlete mileage um, in a boot. And so they said, oh God, this is bad. So what they do is they casted it and they said like, normally we put you in a boot, but like, we can't have that happen again. So they put her in a hard cast. She comes back for her next checkup. The cast is mangled. She it's was impressive. running her normal mileage in a hard cast on her lower extremity. That is both sad and impressive. Yeah. Yeah. And so then what they did, because it was so bad, they recast it and it was a lower extremity injury. They recasted with her knee fixed at a 90 degree angle to say like, you, you cannot, you know what I mean? Like it's physically impossible now unless you cut this thing off. Um, and so the, the end result of that was, uh, fortunately, you know, they were good clinicians. They had their eyes open. 
uh, they referred her to inpatient care for her eating disorder. Um, and, and so then, you know, she was successfully treated, healed up, happy ending. But um, that's just one extreme example where you start to see how these things all kind of uh, work together in, in, into this kind of cyclical thing where there's the disordered eating that kind of fuels this low energy availability and then the clinical manifest manifestations uh, arise from there. So um, once again, in this case, when we're talking about female athlete triad, um, you know, this is generally perceived to be driven by that, that energy drain rather than just the stress of exercise. So female athlete triad is really an expanded look at what happens when a female athlete has low energy availability in the more uh, kind of chronic term rather than short term, I would say. Because uh, it, it's the type of thing where it's it's been going on so long that you actually see changes in bone, which generally take, you know, much more time than something like menstrual cycle disruption. Uh, you know, the menstrual cycle is really, when it comes to anything with uh, energy availability, um, the menstrual cycle is kind of the canary in the coal mine where it yeah. is. It's the early warning system. It, yeah, it's an early warning system. It is such, it's so rapidly responsive to changes in energy availability and, uh, you know, it'll take a while before you, you know, bone density starts to reduce over time. And then it gets to a point where eventually now you, it's actually low enough and you have an acute injury where it becomes a, a fracture. Um, but yeah, um, usually the, uh, it, it's easy to see why it took them some time to make that jump from loss of menstrual cycle to this kind of more delayed manifestation of chronic low energy availability over time. Um, so just some, uh, some props here. Like I said, this is part history, uh, and, and part science here to the history of science, some props to key researchers in this area. So I mentioned Ann Luke's, uh, really laid a lot of the foundation for low energy availability research. Uh, and then some other folks who are really big in this area with low energy availability and the female athlete triad, we've got Constance Lebrun, Nama Consta Constantini, Michelle Warren and Barbara Drinkwater. Um, so this was an area where there are some really uh, ambitious, industrious researchers working around the clock to uh, to get a lot of this science hammered out uh, pretty quickly uh, over a relatively short time scale. Relative to uh, you know, research timelines aren't necessarily as long as geological timelines, but they're not that far off, right? Things happen slowly. Um, and if I can point out, this is one of those instances where there was a fundamental change to practice among coaches, uh, nutritionists, physios, and the entire infrastructure of the actual practitioners who work with athletes, especially in endurance sport. But then it did start to bleed over into team sport and just women's sport in general um, due to this research. So it is another example of the ivory tower being completely disconnected from what needs to happen being behind the times, not leading the charge, and really being a completely useless field, that of exercise science, I would just point out. Absolutely. Yeah. So now I want to transition. I'm trying to steal the show. I see what you're doing. I am trying to steal the show. I'm sorry. And actually, can I say one thing? There is, um, like, like you talked about how, uh, where the development of the, the female athlete triad and, and research that was laying the foundation for this, are you going to transition now to like a, a lateral transition to metabolic adaptation or, or, or somewhere in that way? No, we're still building. Okay. Well, cause I, I have a, there isn't, I'm gonna let you build, but there's an interesting piece that there's a paper that Luke's published in 2003, which may be far ahead of where we're out of the timeline, which I think is a critical, uh, piece that, that, that directed that field a certain way that maybe led to. Uh, I'm flexible. Yeah. I'm nimble. Yeah. Okay, cool. So in, in kind of my own kind of trying to link some of these things together, I noticed that there was a specific, uh, divergent path towards, yep. Not only is it not, as you said, those two potential theories of, is it just exercise is too stressful or is it the energy availability, uh, it's energy availability with strong empirical support. There was another, I would say, lesser hypothesis that is related to energy availability, kind of the effect of it, and that is low body fat um, that uh, Ann Luke's kind of shut the door on. I think with good reason, in 2003, she wrote a, a review paper that she was a sole author on that was published in a very high-impact journal, um, Exercise Science Reviews, 
exercise or exercise and sports science reviews in 2003 titled energy availability, not body fatness regulates reproductive function of women. Very telling title. And, uh, and they specifically basically demonstrated, uh, across a number of different research articles that were summarized in this review that, Hey, independent of the body fat of women, you can see luteinizing hormone disruption when you put someone on an extreme low energy availability diet. Uh, despite the fact that they may be high in body fat. And I think that echoed all the way up to the present time, which is very interesting, in that kind of being a discounted factor or just not even acknowledged, not necessarily actively discounted, as potentially playing a role, um, which is, I think, for me, as someone who focuses on how lean you have to get for physique sport, I've always been like, really? We don't think that plays a role at all. Um, and, and that I, I kind of, I personally kind of identified that paper is probably the departure point between some of these lines of research. So I, I think that's a, an important part of the story and you might've already been getting to that. And I'm just sitting here and trying to advance the plot too quickly. It, it's, it's interesting too, because I think when you think about the populations where low energy availability is studied, it's usually, you know, the, the classic example is like a, a female track and field team right? And yes. the endurance runners on that team. And so what's interesting there is, first of all, you probably don't, probably don't have too many athletes who are getting like stage lean uh, in those sports. And so I wouldn't expect leanness to necessarily be the thing that's dictating who has amenorrhea and who does not, uh, or other clinical manifestations. Um, and then also when you think about those teams to, you know, whether it's track and field, cross country, or even a team sport Soccer, where there, yeah. there's any kind of pressure to be lean, uh, whether it's for, you know, a, a variety of reasons that there are those pressures. In most cases, you will actually somewhat paradoxically, but it makes sense when you think through it, you will observe the greatest acute lack of energy availability in the athletes on that team who actually have the higher body fat levels because they are the ones feeling the pressure to really be restrictive and kind of catch up with the rest of the pack in terms of leanness, yes. whether that's for performance reasons or, you know, peer pressure or even self-imposed pressure to kind of look the part relative to their teammates. It may have nothing to do with, with performance in their sport um, in, in an objective sense, but it might be just like there's a certain way that everyone on my team looks and I, I feel pressured to look that way, you know? Um, and so... Yeah, it's it, you. You kind of paradoxically will find the most extreme manifestations of low energy availability in the women on the team who actually have the higher body fat levels rather yep. than lower, uh, and so that's really important to recognize. And I, I, I'm not sold on the idea that body fat plays no role, but I'm extremely sold on the fact that you can definitely have uh, clinically relevant magnitudes of low energy availability with plenty of body fat. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I do think that as you get to certain body fat levels, it, it's it's just not going to happen in terms of, you know, menstrual cycle. I mean, to get to those very, very, very low body fat levels, it usually takes a bit of a grind. You know, you don't really get there by accident. And, you know, there, there are certain body fat levels where Helms, you and I have been there. Yeah, I, I can eat in a, a small surplus for a couple weeks, but I'm not expecting <laughs> reproductive function to be back to back to normal for quite some time you know what i mean so um i think one of the the issues there is it's so hard to get enough research on a large enough sample size of people who actually get to that body fat level that you can you know pop it into a regression and say oh yeah there we find the exact body fat level where things start to you know the the lower intervention point you know so to speak right. where where people are really below their comfortable body fat level but but no that that's a fantastic um a fantastic observation. And I think that probably uh, sets us up now to transition into the the newest iteration of, of this whole uh, milieu of, of symptoms, which is very much expanded. So we started out with low energy availability as being something that seems to disrupt the menstrual cycle. Then we expanded the female athlete triad and we're saying, well, no, there's also some disordered eating in the mix in many cases. And we're seeing changes in bone density and therefore fracture risk. Then uh, came along the idea of red S, or I'm going to call it REDS because it rolls off the tongue easier, relative energy deficiency in sport. And when I think of REDS, 
I, I think of papers by Louise Burke. I think of, of course, Margot Mountjoy, uh, who who has written the IOC position stand on it um, with a bunch of uh, really smart folks. So relative energy deficiency in sport is basically the result of decades of observation and research coming together where people said, okay, the female athlete triad is legit. This happens. However, there's so much more happening than three things. Mm. <laughs> you know, there's we're seeing performance ramifications. We're seeing psychological ramifications. We're seeing uh, widespread endocrine dysregulation. It's not just luteinizing hormone, right? It, it's not just estrogen. We're, we're seeing uh, changes in thyroid hormone. We're seeing changes across the board in a variety of endocrine markers. Um, so it, just this really broad spectrum collection of symptoms that are observed when someone has low energy availability, particularly for an extended duration of time. And so relative energy deficiency in sport, I think the the two areas where this represented a massive change in the way this is discussed, number one, when you look at any review paper about relative energy deficiency in sport, you see that, I mean, they've probably attributed between performance and health ramifications, I would guess at least 20 um, elements that they kind of attribute to to relative energy deficiency in sport. So in, we worked our way from like three to like 20. It's a lot. Um, because if you've ever had really low energy availability for a long time, you know that almost everything changes, right? Your hair and your fingernails grow slower. Like you are in a different state of, of being when, when, when you're in that really extreme energy, uh, you know, uh, restricted, restricted state. So that's one major change. The other major change, pertinent to folks like you and me, Eric, all of a sudden guys were in the mix, mm -hmm. right? So this whole research line started because like I said, the menstrual cycle really is the canary in the coal mine. It is like this, you know, very sensitive uh, process that, and when I say sensitive, I mean sensitive to energetic perturbations, Right. Very shortly after there's insufficient energy, we see a response that is so obvious and so quantifiable. And there really is no analogous process in men, in males, that we can point to and say, oh, looks like over the last few weeks, you've not had enough energy around, right? But over time, researchers said, you know, I know we've been focusing on female athletes up to this point, but athletes and clinicians, I should say, Clinicians, practitioners, uh, researchers, everybody ha has been making these uh, these observations simultaneously. And they say, you know, guys are in pretty bad shape too when they're uh -huh. not, you know, eating enough to fuel their training. And so relative energy deficiency in sport is where we currently are uh, with this kind of trajectory of research topics. And I think this is probably where I've erred the most with regards to how I have historically discussed uh, metabolic adaptation because, and, and I, I know why I erred in the way I've approached this is because when I first started writing about metabolic adaptation, the focus certainly was energy expenditure because I was always looking at it through the lens of a bodybuilder. This is making it harder for me to really do that final dig at the end of prep to get leaner. And what's making that harder? Well, First and foremost, my energy expenditure is way lower than I bargained for, right? But from a bodybuilder's perspective, this is where I erred in judgment. I wasn't wrong, but this is just, it's convoluted. It mixes too many terms. I said, well, that's not the only thing that sucks about this. <laughs> that's not the only thing that gets hard when you're a bodybuilder experiencing metabolic adaptation, right? So metabolic adaptation, as we've talked about many times before, really has two drivers, and they are correlated, but they're not the same thing. So the two drivers for metabolic adaptation, one is the loss of body fat. And so we see that people who have lost large amounts of body fat, let's say going from 50% body fat to 20, 22% body fat, those are folks who in the literature experience large reductions uh, in total daily energy expenditure and usually pretty substantial adaptive drops in energy expenditure. However, they're not necessarily going to be having these symptoms of, you know, low testosterone and, you know, amenorrhea, low, you know, they're not really getting this whole milieu of symptoms that we, that we saw with relative energy deficiency in sport. 
just by virtue of losing that body fat. Usually with, with bodybuilders and physique athletes where we start to see that other stuff, those other symptoms that make dieting really, really, really suck. It's usually a mixture of a couple other things. It's not just the amount of body fat lost, but as you said, Helms, it's getting to very low body fat levels below a person's what we call their lower intervention point, basically below the lowest body fat level that their body is really comfortable maintaining for extended periods of time, right? So there's the loss of body fat. There is the absolute level of body fat that seems to matter with metabolic adaptation. And then there's also the actual presence of low energy availability when you're still digging in that diet. And what's really interesting about that is you know, you could be taking a nice gradual cut. Let, let's start with an extreme example from, you know, 50% body fat down to five for, for a male bodybuilder, right? So you could be going nice and slow, cruising. It's quite the off season. It is. You're, you're cruising nice and slow from 50 all the way down to 20. And you might have an adaptive reduction in energy expenditure, mostly from non-exercise activity. But, uh, but throughout that process, you know, you're you're probably not going to be experiencing all those other crappy things that make make us, you know, in, in relative energy deficiency in sport, the kind of things that make us say, hey, this is like not good for you. You know, when you're cruising from 50 to 20 and taking it nice and slow, people are going to say, yeah, you're probably dieting on fewer calories than you hoped, but you are categorically like healthier and looking great, feeling great, et cetera. Um, now, that's not to say it's going to be easy, right? Dieting is hard, period. There's nothing easy about it. But you would not be experiencing this kind of endo- this widespread endocrine disruption that manifests in clinically relevant symptoms. Um, now, then you... You might even see an increase in testosterone as a male. Absolutely. You probably would see an increase in testosterone, a reduction in estrogen. So you'd have a more androgenic kind of balance of, of sex hormones. Um, so yeah, you'd probably be feeling great from that. Now, as you're going from 20 to 5, you could, well, let's say 20 to 10. That could go mm. two different ways, right? You could continue cruising nice and easy, plenty of energy availability, but just a big enough deficit to keep weight, you know, moving in the right direction, and you may be just fine. If you decide at 20 to 10 that you are going to just sprint your way there, and you in- invite all this very low energy availability with this huge caloric deficit, you may start seeing those symptoms of, of REDS long before you get below your lower intervention point, right? So there's these different forces that are at play here that are causing these symptoms of REDS that are not necessarily the same thing as metabolic adaptation. But the reason that I tended to bring them into the conversation when looking at it through a bodybuilding lens is because of what happens from 10% to 5 which is that from 10% to 5 almost everybody, maybe not everybody, after some of the interviews we've had on Iron Culture, which is crazy mm-hmm. to me, but yep. almost everybody on that journey from 10 to 5, I don't really care how you do it, you're going to start seeing some of these symptoms of REDS. Uh, now, obviously, you're probably setting yourself up for a better time if you take it nice and slow. You know, you do it very judiciously, but ultimately we're seeing those three different elements uh, of, you know, the bodybuilder's experience of metabolic adaptation. The actual drop in energy expenditure is what I would now call the actual metabolic adaptation. Those other red symptoms, they are commonly observed with it, but I, I think my biggest error was kind of conflating them all as one big thing rather than treating it as metabolic adaptation with REDS. Go ahead, Helms. I was just going to say that, yeah, and if that discussion of 10 to 5, if you're uh, a female listener, you could basically think of that as the the process of going from just under 20 to around 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 10 or maybe dipping into barely single digits. Correct, as an yeah. equivalent body yeah. fat range. My tiny brain, I always, I'm very self-centered, Helms. I, I'm always thinking about me, so I'm thinking male body fat numbers, but yes, you're correct. There's there's always that kind of standard adjustment for the uh, the female analogous values. Yeah, I'm just I'm just you know I'm the same way. Like we we view this because we both competed in bodybuilding through our own personal experience, and I think that's understandable to the listener. But I just want to make sure we're drawing many circles as we can here. Absolutely. So now here's a big wrench I want to throw in the mix, and this is another place where 
I have erred in uh, my interpretation in the past. Um, but luckily, no one in the fitness industry talks about it, so I've never erred publicly. <laughs> this is only privately that I've erred in my interpretation. So um, the reason that this one hurts is because I'm going to talk about the exercise hypogonadal male condition. Mm. I don't think I've ever heard someone talk about it in the fitness industry by name. I have heard specifically to give credit to the barbell medicine guys, them talk about it specifically in one of their testosterone series. Good but for them. It's, it's not typically talked about. Also, another another shout out in private conversation, Ben House and I have talked about it, kind of thinking about the difference between, say, like old Amish communities and the the Hadzda. I always mispronounce that. Apologies if I did it again. And how you see uh, some differences there. But I won't spoil the plot. You get after it. So this term was coined by Hackney and colleagues in 2005. So we're talking about stuff that's, you know, not brand new, but 2005. Like, I remember being in a physiology class uh, it, during my PhD and being stunned that leptin was discovered after I was, like, alive. And I was like, no way. Like, leptin seems like such a foundational, like, so important in physiology. But anyway, this term was coined by Hackney and colleagues in 2005. And it describes endurance-trained men with low basal testosterone levels. Um, now, there had been a lot of misinterpretations about this because a lot of folks, myself included, have said, oh, cool, so you mean like basically like the male athlete triad, right? So it's like low energy availability causes low testosterone in these you know lean folks who do endurance exercise. And that is explicitly not the case. So I, I read through a... a a recent review paper by Hackney. Um, and I should mention, he taught my exercise physiology course in my master's degree um, and like my whole endocrine section. So like, it's awful that I had this misinterpretation for so long. <laughs> I, I should have paid better attention. He would, uh, he would scold me uh, if, if he heard this. But um, when they laid out these kind of key characteristics of the exercise hypogonadal male condition, they were as follows. So it's men with testosterone levels at least 25 to 50% lower than expected for their age. So a substantial uh, reduction in testosterone. Um, this lowered testosterone did not appear to be a transient phenomenon related to the acute stress of exercise. Um, these men are not experienced a performance decrement or a drop in motivation. So this is not overtraining syndrome. Uh, these men have not experienced a major body weight loss in recent months. So these aren't people who are presumably in very low states of energy availability. Uh, men had a history of early involvement in sports, uh, resulting in them having many years of essentially daily exercise. Uh, and the exercise modality most commonly observed, we're talking about running, triathlons, cross-country skiing, and race walking. So high volume endurance type exercises. So What's really interesting about this, um, this, this most recent review paper I read by Hackney is he really came out and said, hey guys, I'm glad you're all interested in this condition, but it's not what everyone's writing about because you're all writing about low energy availability as the cause of this. And we have reason to believe that this is actually not driven by acute low energy availability. Uh, and in the paper, he actually argues, um, you know, it's very possible that these individuals, you know, they're, they're not experiencing compromised performance. They don't seem to experience any compromised health metrics. They're not reporting staleness. They're loving their training, performing well. They're healthy. They just have low testosterone, <laughs> which is not what you see with, uh, you know, kind of analogous situations with the female athlete triad. So this is clearly a different thing. Um, and so he, he kind of wrote this paper to summarize a life of research, really. Um, like, I mean, uh, you know, Hackney's been working on the foundations of this since probably the 80s when they first started poking around and didn't coin the term until 20 years later, really. But um, anyway, what they're really trying to do is saying, hey, this is a different thing than overtraining syndrome. It's a different thing than REDS. Um, this is its own unique thing that might actually represent uh, just an adaptation. So not a, not a maladaptive state of low testosterone, but an adaptive state of, te of low testosterone. 
And what's really fascinating is in this paper, he actually specifically draws a parallel to the ener- um, uh, constrained energy expenditure model by my current advisor, Herman Ponser, um, mm-hmm. which kind of ties us into, now we're deviating into yet another area. And so what uh, Hackney argues in this paper is like, hey, we look at these hunter-gatherer communities who are lean but not starving. You know, they're able to support all, you know, they're getting all the food that they need, but they're lean individuals. They're extremely active relative to, you know, more industrialized uh, populations or industrialized economies. And what we see in those populations is apparently adaptive mechanisms that keep their total energy expenditure lower than predicted based on their high activity level. But also in those populations, we see low testosterone levels. And they don't have, it's not so low that there are rampant fertility issues, but there seem to be adaptations in this this population where basal testosterone levels and energy expenditure levels are just kind of titrated. They're just adapted to the environment uh, and, and to some of the uh, environmental challenges uh, of, you know, being very, very active and, you know, having to actually hunt and gather food. So what's really fascinating is Hackney kind of says, it seems like perhaps through chronic, just the stress of training, um, all the adaptations that come with exercise, um, which do include one area where I'm, I just started digging today. I think it's very fascinating that you can alter the morphology and the function of mitochondria by injecting leptin. Like you give more leptin and the mitochondria go to shit. Pardon my language, but they morphologically, visually change and they functionally change in in the way that they operate. And I think anytime you're talking energy, you have to be thinking mitochondria at top of mind. The one thing that's interesting is that there's some research indicating that chronic exercise training can reduce leptin, like basal leptin levels, even in the, I wouldn't say in the absence of fat loss, but independent of fat loss. Like there are conflicting papers in this area, but Basically, again, this is where I'm telling you, I don't really know yet what I'm doing with this information, but there seems to be something here where chronically high activity levels, particularly with endurance activity or non-exercise activity, I don't think we're lifting our way there to, you know, to this level of activity. Um, But there does seem to be adaptive changes that kind of reestablish the, um, the kind of defended level, so to speak of act, uh, of uh, energy expenditure and of testosterone, which is very, very fascinating, but it adds another wrinkle here, right? So we've talked about things that influence this whole um, umbrella of terms. We've got the amount of fat you have lost, your current fat level relative to your upper and lower intervention points, um, your your current energy availability, and now just your general physical activity level even if you have adequate energy availability to fuel that activity. Uh, Now, another thing that Hackney talks a lot about in this paper is overtraining syndrome, because a lot of folks, like back in the day, the classic overtraining papers, it was mostly endurance folks, and they would say, hey, they have low testosterone, high cortisol. If you want to know if someone's overtraining, measure their testosterone and cortisol, boom, it's this endocrine marker. And Hackney was saying, well, just because we're seeing low testosterone here does not make this overtraining because they're performing great. They're feeling great. Everybody's happy. No staleness. They love getting out there and running. We're all good. This is just low testosterone with no clinical ramification that we can find. Now, overtraining syndrome is interesting because it's to circle all the way back around Trent Stellingworth, who is fantastic. Um, been chatting with him a little bit lately. Very brilliant guy. Uh, wrote a paper, a uh, systematic review, I think, on overtraining recently. And Helms, I think you covered this in mass. Uh, but this ba- is the one where they're saying, is it is it low energy availability or is it overtraining syndrome? Exactly. So Great they, paper. Did, they basically said, you know, they were not refuting the fact that, you know, non-functional overreaching or overtraining syndrome can occur uh, in the absence of low energy availability, they, they didn't come out and definitively say there's no such thing as overtraining. It's just low energy availability. But if you look at their paper, they demonstrated that you have to work pretty hard to find evidence of overtraining syndrome in scenarios where you can actually rule out 
low energy availability. If you look at the vast majority of papers on overtraining syndrome, low energy availability happens to be a very common observation in those papers. Uh, So a a quote from their paper was, uh, therefore, low energy availability or REDS should be ruled out uh, from an overtraining syndrome diagnosis, and once all confounding factors have been excluded, have been exclu- excluded, uh, the overtraining syndrome diagnosis would ultimately be based on outstanding psychogenic and lifestyle stress factors being responsible for the unexplained prolonged fatigue and decreased performance. So what they were saying there is before you're starting to even talk about, hey, I think there's some overtraining syndrome here, you need to rule out the fact that all you're seeing there is low energy availability or REDS. Um, and then again, they mentioned that the other things that could be going on, uh, you know, psychogenic and lifestyle stress factors, lack of sleep, just psychological stress, those things, you know, then can play a big factor in addition to just simply excessive training load. Go ahead, Helms. Yeah, and I just for the, for the listeners who haven't listened to our full catalog, Definitely go back and listen to an episode that Omar and I did specifically on overtraining as we talked about what the actual definition is and that it's actually never been observed true overtraining syndrome in any resistance training study. Um, Importantly, the definition, what at the consensus, if there is one, has landed on in this area of research is that overtraining syndrome is defined by multiple months of suppressed performance. So performance actually declining not just plateauing, not just not going as well as you'd like it to, but actually declining that takes that long to recover, even with rest. Um, And as just an aside, it's really interesting that a lot of other things will go poorly and the wheels will start falling off and you're probably more likely to sustain an injury or, or experience athlete burnout psychologically before you can see a purely training induced reduction in performance that's not related to these other factors, just from doing a lot of lifting um, that is sustained. You can absolutely induce overreaching that lasts, you know, temporary periods, anything less than a few months. And that's can be defined as functional or non-functional overreaching. Non-functional overreaching, it doesn't quite reach a couple months, basically the exact same thing. It's overtraining syndrome, your rest and your performance either stays a little bit suppressed, doesn't come all the way back up. But essentially, if it does not improve if you don't experience full recovery that was non-functional like why do we even do that uh, functional overreaching is is you you know you get to that point of suppression less than a couple months you rest and you actually see it come back above baseline so anyway i just wanted that terminology to be out there because i think a lot of people who discuss the existence or the seriousness or the nature of overtraining in the more generic fitness space uh sometimes they're talking across each other because they're not actually using the the consensus terminology. So anyway, I'll just want to leave that there and Kai can drop in the notes the episode where we do discuss overtraining for those who want to do a deeper dive. Absolutely, yeah. And so here's the thing that's really tricky about this though. So like I said, um, psychological or psychogenic stress can contribute to overtraining symptoms. Um, you know, uh, lifestyle factors like lack of sleep can definitely contribute. And Helms, what happens for example, if you have low energy availability and you're below your lower intervention point when you're preparing for a bodybuilding competition? You get less sleep, you have more psychogenic stress. Um, And indeed, I think where you're going to go with this is that there's a ton of shared symptoms between OTS and REDS. Uh, There definitely are. And so you can understand why, like, after a while, Helms, folks like you and I, because we are positioned in this weird space where we're interested in exercise physiology and sports science and then the bodybuilding world, you start looking at all these individual silos that are studying these, you know, oh, I do low energy availability research. I do REDS research. I do exercise hypogonadal male condition research. I do metabolic adaptation research. You start to look at all these things and you're like, I know these aren't the same thing, but damn, you can't write one paper without mentioning two of the others. And and that's literally what I've, if you've kind of caught on to the pattern there, when I'm reading about overtraining, you know, they're mentioning two of these other things. They're mentioning REDS and LEA. Uh, When I'm reading about exercise hypogonadal male condition, it's literally explicitly talking about, um, you know, uh, 
constrained energy expenditure model and overtraining syndrome. Like there are so many of these things that overlap, not just in vaguely, but explicitly. They will go into their discussion section and say, please don't confuse me with these other two things that are clearly overlapping with what I'm talking about. So it's really fascinating that they don't necessarily all reference the same other two in their papers, but it's just this giant web with all these interconnected citations. Uh, And the final thing I want to talk about here is exercise energy compensation, uh, which relates to the constrained energy expenditure model. So um, this is an area where I'm kind of newly dedicating some focus in my research. And this refers to the chronic downregulation of what we can call kind of less essential energy consuming processes in response to high activity levels. Um, Now, low energy availability is definitely involved to some extent, or it can be, I should say. Uh, So there's recently a review paper uh, with Herman Ponser and a few other colleagues. I believe uh, Aymir Dolan was the lead author and Jose Arita was another author on the paper. But they were talking about how it seems like low energy availability can contribute uh, to exercise energy compensation or the constraint of total energy expenditure in regular exercisers. Uh, And there's also evidence that compensation levels go up You do more compensation for your exercise expenditure if you're in negative energy balance. So there's no question that there is a link. Um, However, there also appear to be instances where you can't really attribute all of this to just low energy availability. So like I said, when you look at hunter-gatherer populations, um, you'll see folks who are not, you know, they don't really report in a lot of these populations high levels of psychogenic stress. Um... They seem to be at stable body weights. You know, food is not easy to come by necessarily, not as easy as in a place with a a supermarket, but they seem to be weight stable and maintaining their body weight effectively, getting the food that they need uh, because, you know, these individuals are brilliant. The amount of knowledge they have in terms of how to live off of the land and forage and hunt and gather what they need is is really remarkable. Um, So we're, we're definitely seeing in some populations in some areas in some, you know, groups of people, energy, exercise energy compensation uh, in situations where we can't just say, oh, it's just low energy availability, there's nothing else to it. Um, And like I said previously, in these populations, we also see generally low testosterone in a way that's fairly asymptomatic. It seems to just represent uh, an adjusted baseline of testosterone that's lower than we see in other populations. Um, So it's really fascinating to see how exercise energy compensation kind of uh, plays into things. And it's it's also fascinating to think about, you know, when uh, when people talk about caloric restriction as a life extension uh, intervention, mm. you know, uh, caloric restriction is often talked about as this kind of, it's really like the only anti-aging thing that like works, you know, caloric restriction in terms of uh, experimental models to meaningfully extend lifespan outside of insect models, actually getting into rodent models. Severe caloric restriction is one of the few things that works. But John Speakman has written about, um, I think what he calls the the empty cupboards hypothesis or something along those lines. But it's the idea that having insufficient energy available for kind of senseless processes, or not senseless, but uh, wasteful processes that are not absolutely critically essential for living right now, could be a very protective thing, you know, just kind of generally slowing down the rate at which you're doing metabolism, um, not mounting these, you know, uh, low level inflammation insults like we see in overfed populations. You know, we always talk about how obesity leads to inflammation, which leads to just about every chronic disease that we're worried about. Not the, not the sole cause, but inflammation is tied to heart disease, stroke, diabetes, uh, a variety of brain conditions, right? Inflammation sucks. It's not good. And in chronically slightly overfed folks, we have enough energy to waste that we're constantly mounting these little immune responses and these little inflammatory responses that are very wasteful and also somewhat just very slightly deleterious. And when you do that for 70 years, it manifests as, a, a, you know, a an acceleration of aging, so to speak. Um, So much as you could say 
that caloric energy restriction in a way doesn't leave you enough energy for your stupid inflammatory responses to keep responding to all these little things. And that can be a protective thing. I think you might be able to say that that could be one of the really nice things about exercise and and the resulting exercise energy compensation is if you're able to sustain really high levels of physical activity um, without overfeeding, I'm wondering if perhaps there's kind of a shared mechanism there where, you know, when, when we look at these populations of folks who are not necessarily dieting, but they're relatively lean and they exercise a ton, they have, of course, lower testosterone, but they also have lower levels of inflammation at baseline because who can spare the energy for all these spurious, you know, little fluky inflammatory responses that essentially accelerate our aging. And so when you look in these populations, um, obviously there are other threats to mortality in some of these places that that we don't see as much in more industrialized populations with, um, you know, you know there, there's different, um, you know, mortality risks in different areas and different populations. But one thing that we don't tend to see in a lot of these hunter-gatherer populations is rampant uh, inflammation-linked chronic diseases. We don't see a lot of heart disease and atherosclerosis yeah. and things like that. Um, so anyway, again, just thinking out loud, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, to kind of go on that same train of thought, it's um, it's also really interesting when you start to look at, uh, when you take a few of these key pieces away, that's when the wheels start to fall off. Because we have this, we have this data you know, Herman Ponser is probably popularized more than anyone else on hunter-gatherer societies. And then there is not that much, but there is some data, which I find really compelling, on old Amish communities, what are essentially pre-industrial, post-agricultural societies, where at least the men have comparable levels of activities, if we were to measure it by step counts, to the, uh, the hunter-gatherer societies. So you look at these male hunters and these male farmers, similar step counts, but a greater yield of energy for the same level of activity. So the efficiency has gone up, but it's still requiring the activity. And then the lineage from going from, say, the the, the few hundred years or more than a few hundred years, the hundreds of years compared to the tens of thousands of years of, you know, functional, we got enough food, but we are hunter-gatherers. We got to constantly move to get enough just to stay sufficient to carry the tribe forward. And that's good. We're healthy, but we're definitely regulated and suppressed because that's what's needed for the tribe to continue to, oh, hey, well, now we've got butter. Yeah. Now we've got milk. Now we've got animals that are always right here. And you wake up, where, where, where's the the uh, the herd you got to kill? Oh, I own it. <laughs> it's right there. Yeah. You know? And and you look at the data on the uh, the Amish, for example, uh, and some of the people like actors in, in Australia who are replicating the lives of settlers, and they are having energy expenditures that are over a thousand calories more at the same body weight than some of the, the, the you know, the, the, the hunter gatherers and they're consuming also a thousand calories more. There's a, a master's thesis that I found that I kind of cross populated because I was looking at the same groups in the eighties versus the studies in the nineties. It's not direct data. We need a little more, at least, or I haven't found it, but anyway, there's data on the energy expenditure and pedometers in old Amish communities and their energy intake. And some of these stuff that I thought was pretty comparable, it's like, Average intake of 3,800 calories a day in men. And we're talking at a body weight of maybe, you know, 75 kilos, 75, 80 kilos, right? Yeah. And clocking 20 to 30,000 steps per day, right? Yeah. So that is very different to then what we see in modern society where the typical person is in, in like the United States, probably clocking 5,000 steps, you know? So that little piece comes out. And that got even more pronounced, even just, I would say 1970 is when we really started to see precipitous declines in the amount of chores and housework people had to do as more appliances got developed. Um, And here we are. Yeah. And I need another research term, like I need another hole in the head at this point in the episode. But what you're describing with the Amish population versus hunter-gatherer population, I think it introduces the, the additional concept of energy flux. Right. Blocks. Yes, yeah. Because we're, we're yep. seeing, yeah, we're seeing people that are maintaining a similar state in terms of kind of like net energy balance, but at very different levels of energy flux. Right. Uh, so the Amish folks are churning through energy, higher input, higher output at a given activity level. Whereas in the hunter gatherer folks, we're seeing uh, still a high activity level, uh, 
activity level in terms of steps and movement, but constrained expenditure that is matched to a much lower input of calories per day. So they're ending up at a similar, you know, body composition kind of makeup, but with very different routes and very different adaptive processes that are making that happen. So um, I I will say, I I think that's the next literature that I need to dive into is going to be looking at some of that work in, in Amish folks and other communities that do kind of small scale farming, but, but still very high yield farming with with very active lifestyles. Um, But I tell you what, Helms, I want to try to tie a little bow on this very concisely. So like I said, this episode, I think if you like physiology, you like weight regulation, energy expenditure regulation, I think it's a fun ride, right? But there's clearly a lot to be done here in terms of sorting out exactly where these concepts overlap and exactly where there are distinctions and, uh, you know, differences among them. But I think when we get into fitness, we expect this is going to be great, right? Whatever type of fitness you're pursuing, whether it's sport or bodybuilding, which is a sport, but a different kind of sport, you know, team sports, endurance athlete, endurance sports, bodybuilding, whatever. You get into it and you say, okay, this should make me feel better, should make me healthier, objectively. I should feel great. I should perform great. And the more I stick with it, the better I should feel, the better I should perform. Happy story, right? This whole umbrella of terms basically describes what happens when that social contract between you and exercising breaks down, right? And you say, wait a minute, why do I feel bad now, (laughs) right? Uh, Why am I performing worse despite the fact that I'm maintaining my training, right? So this whole set of ideas, I think that's kind of my easiest way to summarize how they all fit together under this umbrella is this is when things start turning the other direction. And for some reason, you're performing worse or feeling worse, or you're having actual deleterious health outcomes that are secondary to your engagement in behaviors that are categorically healthy on the surface, right? Exercising, watching what I eat, et cetera. So what I would argue or or what I would uh, tell folks as kind of a useful parting message uh, for now, put a pin in this, we'll come back to it maybe in a year. Um, If you are experiencing something that seems like metabolic adaptation or REDS or overtraining syndrome or even exercise energy compensation, those four things, I think the first thing that you want to do is think about am I in a state of low energy availability? Because if you figure that out, it's probably going to illuminate your path toward getting out of whatever is going on, right? So for example, if you're feeling symptoms of overtraining syndrome and you notice, oh, wow, now that I look at it more objectively, I am in a state of low energy availability, that's your first course of action. Correct your energy availability and see if things persist. That's going to tell you a lot about how you proceed from there. Um, now another thing is, you know, if you are in a very weight reduced state or if you have super low body fat and you think maybe this is just below my lower intervention point, like maybe this is too lean for me to be sustainably stuck at while still feeling great and, you know, not having any symptoms. If you're in that kind of state, you're going to be looking at probably metabolic adaptation and or REDS and you can have one without the other. You know, it, it's not that unusual to have metabolic adaptation without REDS uh, if we define metabolic adaptation as exclusively pertaining to, you know, an adaptive reduction in energy expenditure. Um, if you're notice, if if you have a level of exercise that seems like it could just be absolutely excessive, like maybe this is just too much for your body to to manage at this time, too much too soon, so to speak. Uh, or you've just been doing crazy high volume for a crazy long time, and this is specifically more oriented toward endurance training. It's very possible that you're looking at overtraining syndrome. It could be exercise energy compensation that that you're experiencing, um, which obviously would feel and and look differently. But if you're noticing that um, specifically you have low testosterone, but you actually feel kind of great, and it doesn't seem like your your energy availability is super low, It could just be that excessive exercise uh, or high volume exercise. At this point, I wouldn't even call it excessive, right? There's no maladaptation going on. You might just have low testosterone because you exercise a lot 
due to the exercise hypogonadal male condition. Um, if you have a lot of lifestyle stressors, poor sleep, a lot of stress at work, a lot of family stress going on, you know, you've got three kids under the age of four and you're barely getting by and you work a high stress job, you want to definitely be keeping an eye out for things like overtraining syndrome and just general endocrine dysregulation, right? It, just the fact that you're stressed out and not sleeping much will have some endocrine system hallmarks, some kind of key things that occur, some changes in hormone levels that may have nothing to do with your training load or your energy availability. It would not be unusual at all for you to have high cortisol, low testosterone just because you're sleeping like crap and stressed out not you know around the clock. Um, and then finally, if your main concern here is that you've got performance impairment, if that's the main thing that's causing you to look around under this umbrella of terms, uh, what you want to be thinking about, first of all, you know, perhaps you've got low energy availability, which may or may not be causing other symptoms of REDS, or perhaps if you really are pushing your volume, especially for endurance athletes, probably exclusively for endurance athletes, you could have good old fashioned overtraining syndrome, but Overtraining syndrome is one of those things that the ratio of how much it's talked about versus how often it is observed in outside of like Olympic trials competitors who are like training, uh, there, there's a huge mismatch. You know, your, your average Joe, like you or me, Helms, we're not getting overtraining syndrome because we're putting in a couple miles or even training for a marathon, right? I mean, it's usually people who are- I would say, like for our listeners- um, if you are a very serious, regularly engaged CrossFit competitor or someone who lifts, who is an endurance athlete, I can almost, almost guarantee that you're not experiencing it. Yeah. It, if it, you're not in those two categories. It's talked about all the time. It's very rarely observed outside of people who literally exercise for a living, like professional yeah. runners who put in uh, insane mileage, right? Yeah. Um, it's a diagnosis by exclusion which I think is an important thing for people to realize. You can help you understand how how rare it is because of that. Where we go, okay, it's not low energy availability. Okay, it's it's not uh, like a, like life stress purely. Okay, it's not an illness or chronic fatigue syndrome or anything like that. Okay, then maybe it's this. And let's check some other markers and, and keep going. Yeah. All right, so Helms, that is my kind of like quick summary to kind of tie these together, put some practical uh, spin on it to help people figure out once that, you know, once that contract breaks down between you and exercise and you're noticing that your fitness uh, is taking you the other direction, not towards your goals, further from them, from them in terms of your health or how you're feeling or how you're performing, what you want to do is think very carefully about what are the different named conditions or syndromes or, or you know, elements that fall under this general umbrella and start sorting through if I'm experiencing this, but I'm not experiencing that and I'm not having low energy availability, where am I going on this uh, this grid of potential options? So these are terms that often get conflated and hand up, I'm the first person to admit I've done way too much conflating of metabolic adaptation with REDS. And I think we see that this across the board where people are are mixing and matching these terms and lumping them together um, without really knowing that they are necessarily turning two things into one thing. Um, you know, it, it's totally fine to acknowledge that they often happen in parallel, but it's important to keep that little bit of buffer between them so that you can speak about them more uh, more deliberately and more specifically. Um, so yeah, I, I think for now, it's probably the most helpful I can be on the matter, but this is an area that I'm going to really sink my teeth into, and I'm hoping I can give an update in the future where maybe there's some kind of unified model uh that it really ties it all together trucks you did a fantastic job of that i think it's extremely informative for the people who like the deep dives on science and understanding what is going on with the hood not just the potential outcomes and applications from it i think they're going to love this episode i loved it um this is absolutely uh fascinating stuff in my opinion and to give you some uh i'm going to give you a pass on this one to not feel so bad about conflating these things because i think the reason why you can create a unified message is because you conflated them. And the the pros and cons, the double-edged sword of you and I and a few other people I can think of in our space who are in the bodybuilding arena and kind of end up finding themselves in a more general physiology, exercise, lifting, nutrition 
uh, science communication position is that we have a bodybuilding lens, which has pros and cons. And I would say this is both because many other people wouldn't see the scenario personally and as a coach of where they all converge to conflate them in the first place, to then take a look at the research in a more kind of dispassionate place later in your career and go, oh, but they're actually separate. But I always see them together. I see why I made the mistake. But interestingly enough, I see the circumstances where they all converge. And the last little uh, additional bow I will tie just for our physique athlete listeners is that Trexler gave a fantastic flowchart breakdown of what to do, which things might be going on, how to differentiate, and what direction to go, which I think will could be potentially incredibly important for certain athletes. The specific athlete, the bodybuilder, it's important to understand that some of these are obligatory that you will not be able to avoid unless your name is some of the folks that we've interviewed on this channel, but even them, they're going to experience some of them, but some are not. And many of the traditional bodybuilding practices that we're trying to change actually force you to leverage some things that are not obligatory. So if you look at traditional case studies and research on bodybuilders in the 80s and 90s, you're typically seeing resistance training volume go up, cardiovascular training volume go up, and you're seeing short-term diets with very, very low calorie intakes. And you're basically asking to experience energy compensation from exercise, potentially overtraining, which may or may not have occurred, or at least additional symptoms or accelerated symptoms that are going on along with REDS, while striving to get to a very low body fat. And the compensatory then weight regain that will happen because of how stressful that process was, meaning you're losing more weight next time, kind of continuing this whole like lost a lot of body weight, got below your lower intervention point and did it in a very stressful way. So the modern bodybuilder with the information available to you has some choices of how to avoid some of these things. And one of the reasons, for example, at 3DMJ, where we really don't advise, hey, oh, you just had a kid this year, or you just started a new job, or you have a very hectic schedule, or you're undergoing a lot of psychogenic stress, maybe this is not the year to do a contest prep. Because we can, we can opt out of having a, a known level of psychogenic life stress that's going to contribute to this. We can also say, hey, let's do a recovery diet, not rebound as much, take a much more inclusive approach to our nutrition, diet slower, intermittently come out of a state of low energy availability with some of these nonlinear dieting strategies, or just diet for a longer time so energy availability is only low when it needs to be, and then only opting in to basically a certain point when you're probably going to be in a state of low energy availability and a certain point where you must get below your lower intervention point and whatever degree of metabolic adaptation and energy compensation needs to occur for you to reach that deficit from some reasonable combination of hopefully low intensity exercise so you're not risking overtraining syndrome and sufficient amounts of resistance training to maintain muscle mass and the highest energy intake you can while getting to where you need to go. And that can be the difference, I can tell you from anecdotal experiences, between a contest prep that is a, a hard, challenging thing to do, or something that is damn near impossible, may break you, and you would probably only want to have a short career in the sport before you go, oh, that thing is crazy, I never wanted to do it again. That is not a sport, that's a pathology, which we see a whole line of research dedicated to claiming. So yeah, I, I will leave that as a little secondary line item, and that's kind of my whole career. And which a large part of your career as well is is trying to um, get folks to just have to do what they have to do and no more uh, to avoid all these other overlapping Venn diagrams and only sit in a couple. Yeah, yeah, and and the the last thing I'll add, you you put it beautifully there. The last thing I'll add is while we're being careful moving forward about this terminology and keeping just a little buffer between these terms that are similar and they're observed in parallel, but they're not exactly the same thing. The other thing that I'm going to be more mindful of is when I discuss things as being adaptive versus maladaptive, right? Yeah. Because that's also the one final distinction here where you start to see, well, what's the difference between a guy experiencing red S and a guy experiencing, you know, exercise hypogonadal male condition, male condition, um, well, one of them is very clearly maladaptive with clinical downsides. The other one just seems to be purely adaptive. It's just a yep. new state of being with no health ramifications that we've ever observed so far after looking into it for well over a couple decades uh, and no performance downsides. So it's really hard to call that a problem um, until we start to actually say, oh, yeah, here's a, a 
an objective downside to it other than your your you know clinical markers look a little bit different uh, you know your your testosterone level slightly down but other than that everything's fine so uh being careful with terms moving forward and being very careful about it, it made me think about it when you talked about how bodybuilding so pathologized um you know we have to be really careful about what we're uh, presenting as a problem and what we're presenting as an adaptation and uh I think that's all I got to say, Holmes. You want to read us out, thank our sponsors, you know, uh, get the bills paid, all that stuff? Yeah, absolutely. So this is from, uh, this, this, this episode is sponsored by Big Reds, um, which is a, uh, a, new, a new food line that is calorie-free food. Um, and uh, the only way you can get that food is actually chasing a van. It's the Reds van. And it, it actually drives around countries. You can purchase the food, but you have to catch it. So mm. high energy expenditure to reach the Reds fan and then delicious, tasty food that makes you want to eat more of it. Big food engineering, uh, it's great, but low calories, uh, if not any calories. So uh, yeah, you get the, the, the great taste of Reds and the great experience of, of, the, uh, of that syndrome. And um, yeah, so definitely thank our sponsors. And uh, I want to thank you, the dear listener, for tuning in to another episode of Iron Culture. As you know, it'll at least have two of the three of us, or maybe one of the three of us with somebody else on um, every single insert date here. And if you like that, I'd encourage you to like, subscribe, turn on your notifications, and you know what? Maybe even give us a review. And if you're going, God, what kind of review should I give? Well, don't worry. We've got guidance on that. And we look across all platforms. Typically, people are giving us five stars. So that's the recommendation. If that doesn't sit right with you, that's okay. Just do all the other things I said. And don't even leave a rating. Because you can figure that out in the future. And uh, you don't want to spend too much energy doing all those things anyway, because you probably just need to eat more. And you probably need to relax and chill out. So we hope that you'll relax, chill out, eat more, do less exercise, and join us on the next episode of Iron Culture. We'll see you next time.